Kia ora, I'm Chelsea Daniels and this is The Front Page, a daily podcast presented by the New Zealand Herald. New Zealand's fight to attract the minds shaping the future in tech could have just gotten a little bit harder. China has a new visa which targets young STEM grads and foreign tech talent. It's while a similar US visa now comes with a $100,000 fee attached. The move has been described as boosting Beijing's fortunes in its geopolitical rivalry with Washington. Today on the front page, Victoria University Senior Lecturer in Artificial Intelligence, Dr Andrew Lenson is with us to take a look at what makes this country attractive and what might be holding us back. So, Andrew, this new Chinese visa targets young foreign science, tech, engineering and math graduates and promises to allow entry, residence and employment without a job offer. Um, Would this be appealing to the world's greatest young minds, would you say? Potentially. I mean, I think it does depend a little bit on people's ambitions in life, you know, and some of their worldviews. But we are seeing a lot of um, young, bright minds who don't necessarily want to go to the US because of what is happening there, but they still want to be part of this really big sort of technology revolution, right? And so somewhere like China, who probably is uh, the second closest in terms of the opportunities in, in that tech space, may be appealing to some, but as we know, there's also a lot of people who don't always agree with China's views or their approach to things. And so uh, it might attract some, but I'm not sure how impactful it will be in terms of, um, for example, people from New Zealand. Yeah, I mean, some say that this is a result of changes in the US and how their visa Mm. system works. How many of these young people dream of making it to Silicon Valley? Like, is is Silicon Valley the Hollywood for the tech world? Yeah, so it definitely used to be. um, If you think 10 or 15 years ago, right, everyone in my my courses would be thinking about going to Google or going to Facebook. Um, and I think for a lot of people, it still is that sort of holy grail. If you're really into the technical research side, you want to make these really big, large language models and things. But then there's also a lot of people who are looking at that and going, actually, no, that isn't really a line of my values anymore. I don't really feel good about what's going on in the US or, or in the big tech companies because they see the impact on the environment, on, on uh, social systems politically. And so it's appealing still for some people with certain, I guess, um, drive, but not necessarily as widespread as it used to be. Is a Gen Z more conscious about the world around them, perhaps, than us millennials or, or any other yeah. generation were? I think definitely. I mean, when I talk to students about AI, right, a lot of them have um, objections to how it's used, um, how these big companies have sort of forced it on us, um, and how it's been sort of deployed without looking at these environmental costs, these social costs. And so I think they are a lot more aware or um, put a lot more credibility towards those parts of the equation than perhaps um, we're used to. Is New Zealand doing enough to attract this similar talent here? That's a hard question because anyone will tell you we're, we're small and so it's very hard for us to compete um, in terms of developing some of these products. Like we're not going to make our own chat GPT, but at the same time, we could really do some cool stuff in terms of making AI trustworthy and showing the world how to do this the right way and how to do it in a way that puts people first. And I think that is sort of the opportunity we have as one of those moral leaders. And so on that basis, I think Reset certainly could be investing more both financially in terms of attracting talent from overseas, but also in terms of educating our own population, right, bringing up people from high school to university with those skills and investing in education so that we have the homegrown talent as well, because I think we're never going to be able to offer those salaries that, that you see, you know, the millions of dollars you see elsewhere. But we, offer, we can offer sort of a lifestyle, perhaps, and a way of doing things that is more aligned with views that people might hold. Well, that's a really good point, actually, because I read as well that along, you know, the, the, along with this China visa opportunity, they've also done things like, for instance, uh, home purchase subsidies, signing bon- bonuses of up to five million yuan or one point two million dollars. I mean, we, how? How, a, how do we compete with that? And you're saying, well, we could we could really cement ourselves as the mor- morally, ethically um, well-based Silicon Valley, right? Yeah, I mean, and that's what we've done some of the things in the world before, like when there was the nuclear-free movement or when we 
gave universal suffrage to so that women could vote or even wrote some of the stuff with the grassroots call. Like we've made those headlines and those impacts beyond our scale before, right? And so if we were purposeful about it, we too could say, hey, this is how we want to do AI in New Zealand. And I think that is also not just the the, the right thing to do, perhaps in many people's views, but also an opportunity to set ourselves apart economically as a provider of AI products and as a trustworthy place to to do AI and to get AI services from because we have, um, if, if we had the things in place to enable that. And so I think it's, really, it's actually a, a gap in the market as well as uh, an appealing prospect for a lot of younger people. How do we make that happen? Yeah, so I think um, quite a few things, of course, there is that, that financial piece. So we would need to invest in bringing talent here. Um, we also need to invest in education. So better funding of a tertiary and, and secondary school education systems. Um, not just AI, but the wider sector. So thinking about, you know, the humanities, social sciences, because all of those topics are really important as well when we think about how to do this the right way, but also looking at how we best regulate and best put guardrails and, and manage this technology. Not, again, not to stifle innovation, but to provide those certainties and those sort of rules in place so that people, both our own citizens as well as people overseas, are trusting that we're doing things in a good way and that there are appropriate things in place. So I guess there's that financial part, there's the education part, and then also sort of a regulatory piece of work. Personally, yeah, I've, I've you know started using ChatGPT usually for research reasons, like, you know, like I might be interested in a topic or a piece of history or something like that, and I want to sort of get a quick distillation of, of, of something, um, more for personal use. Um, but with respect to government, I mean, we really think AI is a massive opportunity for New Zealand. Um, one of the real challenges we have is that we've not been, we're all working really hard in this country, but we haven't been able to lift our standard of living over the last 30 years. And a big reason for that, one of the big contributing factors is we're not embracing enough technology innovation and, and certainly AI comes into there big time because that's ultimately how government will get much more efficient. Uh, it's ultimately how our businesses will get more efficient as well. When it comes to that education part, are kids mm. today taught, well, A, are they taught anything about AI in, say, high school, primary school, um, or do they really have to leave high school, uh, you know, really interested in STEM and then choose to do that maybe in higher education? Yeah, so we, we saw the uh, Ministry, Ministry of Education did announce some um, work going forward to have AI as part of the curriculum. Um, and so that's a good start. I'm not sure what it's going to look like exactly, but it looks like there is some progress being made there. But at least at the moment, it very much is this sort of self-driven thing. Um, some digital technology teachers are putting it more and more into their, you know, year 12, year, year 13 content, but that often is driven by their own themselves, right? It's not necessarily that they have the support to do that because that's the other thing is a lot of these teachers um, haven't necessarily been trained in technology. They've been trained in other areas and sort of been, you know, asked to teach these courses because there's not anyone available. And so there's also a need to upskill people at high schools to be able to deliver the, the, the education at that level. But also we see when students come to university that often they can be quite interested in it. And so, you know, at Vic we have like a, a first year AI course that is general entry, anyone can do it. And that's a really nice course because they can sort of get a taste for it. And then even if they don't end up doing an AI degree, they still have more knowledge about it. And again, it's about building that broader capability so that we have these this understanding these conversations as well. And I guess just realising that there is a vast spectrum of job opportunities in the AI space. You don't just become, oh, I'm an AI engineer now. Like there are mm. specifics in, involved, right? There are different avenues that you can don't go down. Yeah, definitely. And something we're seeing a lot more of as well is a demand not just for knowing about AI, but also knowing about some other area of science or, or of, of um, or a business, right? So people who can understand AI and how to apply it in the financial sector or understand AI and how to use it in healthcare. Often it's having those sort of joint sets of skills because it's not as simple as just take your AI and plug it in. You need to understand the problem, the data, the ethical and moral issues as well. And so I think, as you said, there's a lot of opportunities out there and I really encourage students to sort of take the, the most they can out of university and get that broader diversity of, of skill sets as well. Have you seen your class size growing? Yeah, so our first year class is at about 250 students this year, which oh, wow. is 
Yeah, it's it's it's, it's busy. Um, and when we first offered it two years ago, it was about a hundred and thirty, hundred forty. So it's gone up quite a bit. Um, and our AI major, which we're the first university to offer that in New Zealand, um, has also gone a lot bigger. We have about sixty or seventy students taking that through the whole program year by year. And so there's certainly an uptake. I think it's one of our faster growing majors, and and of course I'm excited about that. Um, so yeah, it's good. Well, you're in for a job for a, for the foreseeable future, and I, I mean, so. I suppose yeah. <laughs> I suppose these kids know that as well because when we look at the future job market, mm-hmm. I I, th- I think that everyone is going to have to know how at least how to use AI on a basic level, um, just like everyone had to use you know ha- learn mm-hmm. how to use touch phones. Yeah, yeah, I think so, and I think. Um, it's not just being able to use those tools, right? It's not just being able to use Copilot or ChatGPT. It's also about understanding enough about how they work uh, under the hood to know their limitations and their issues and things. Because again, that is where we see a lot of the um, problems crop up is when people misunderstand how these models work or they try and you know, ask it for an answer to something it did wrong. And, and, and once you know a bit about the technology, you start to know why that isn't quite effective. And so... Yeah, I think it is going to be a really important skill set and even just doing one or two courses can really position you as a much more um, capable person going into the workforce. Yeah, and and given how the world is going and how it's progressing towards things like AI, do you think that the tech and AI sector in New Zealand is well-funded at the moment? No, of course not. (laughs) Um, I was hoping you were going to say that. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, look, our our government has kind of, cut funding across all the sciences and even though they are sort of advocating more money for AI we're yet to sort of see what that will look like um, there was an announcement of 70 million dollars but that's kind of old funding for something else being reused over here and so it's not um, the investment that I would want to see again both in terms of supporting small and medium businesses as well as the education sector um, and even research funding like as a as an AI researcher I still have to you know, compete to get funding for things, as I should, but there's not this massive investment in funding to allow us to explore these issues in AI or to talk about these and understand how it impacts New Zealand. And the importance on keeping those social sciences as exactly. well, because not only do we need people plugging in and, and you know, um, making AI, I don't know what the terms are, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but we need to understand how it affects our life and our society as well. Yeah, and we saw that um, the government cut the humanities panel from the Madison Fund this year, and that's one of the biggest um, sort of blue sky, what we call blue sky research funds, which is research that is sort of you know very forward looking and looking at some of these bigger issues. And they cut the funding for that because they're more focused on this sort of economic growth model. But then a lot of myself and my colleagues who are AI people, so we no no you can't do that. We need the humanities now, right? And so even if you don't believe the humanities were important before, which is questionable. At least with, with AI being present, you should really see that it's important to fund that and have those, that social science research about how we use the technology and how it impacts us as a society. Thank you so much for talking with us, Andrew. Thank you. That's it for this episode of The Front Page. You can read more about today's stories and extensive news coverage at nzherald.co.nz. The Front Page is produced by Jane Yee and Richard Martin, who is also our editor. I'm Chelsea Daniels. Subscribe to The Front Page on iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcasts and tune in tomorrow for another look behind the headlines.